first of all, I want to um, talk structure, not just structure and like, like, you know, it's kind of like my trips, tips and tricks portion of coaching, um, my uh, any any Q stun portion. It's the bit where I go over a little, like a lot of smaller bits that are really important to know uh, for beginners. Um, and also a lot about, you know, how can I make my, my act more professional, more streamlined? How can I help myself and my students have not just a knowledge, like a, 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 a productive environment, but how can I make it streamlined so that it works and runs? A good coach, like the difference between a good coach and a great coach is a good coach can manage everything consistently, you know, and, and, and co constantly optimize something. But a great coach, a great coach can create a system that runs itself, right? He creates a system that, that, that he nearly doesn't have to be involved in. Um, there's a lot of about the democratic and autocratic uh, coaching in the next seminar, by the way. This is like high level, or not really, but it's, it's, it's up there with the, the big bosses, right? Um, we'll be talking a lot about, you know, why breaks are important. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, how to source your work. We'll be talking about uh, how to create these exercises that I've been hyping so much. <clears throat> First of all, I went into this in the beginning. But why are breaks important to you? Well, breaks are important because of the fact that the less breaks we have, the less you can concentrate. Uh, the, the US Air Force did test, again, um, reaction tests with a little computer game, actually, so it's relevant to us. That shows that for con concentrating for over 30, 30 minutes at a time, the concentration begins to um, reach a steady decline, right? Um, this decline is emphasized by lack of sleep, lack of uh, water, um, lack of focus and lack of um, interest, right? But overall, the break, like the, the lack of focus kicks in at uh, 30 minutes. Once they did the test with people who were interested, like like super motivated to do this, you know, uh, people who, who were told that their ability to get a job required on them passing this test, their concentration level spiked to around 50 minutes, 50 minutes to an hour. However, even if that's like, you know, you, you t spend five years taking an education, and and you're con like and you're, you're told you know you have to do this for two hours um you have to concentrate on it these people who like put their entire lives on the line for this still could only concentrate at full efficiency for at most an hour okay if you run six hours of coaching or two hours of coaching or three hours of coaching or two years of coaching and don't take a single break your results will be lacking and it will come to a point where if you don't take these breaks, you'll be building more bad habits than you're destroying, right? You'll actually reach a point where the engagement and the focus and the commitment levels are so low that no matter what you do, um, the person is, is dropping off more than they're, they're, they're building on. It's, it's like there's too much wind uh, to build a house right now. Um, so I... I, you know, a lot of people say, you know, all oh, breaks, like, it's just a minor bit, it's just a little bit, you know, little breaky things. But breaks are actually one of the, the key tenets, like, it's, it's a building block, it's a foundation. Please, for the love of God, guys, do me the favor of making sure that you plan for these breaks and make sure that you, you stress them and you underline them and you, like, you enforce them. <clears throat> a lot of people will say to you, you know, I don't need a break, let's just continue another hour. And then you have to be the, the more mature person and say, no, I actually do need a break and so do you. And we're gonna have this break. Because you're the coach, that's your, it's your role to say this to them, right? This is your job. <coughs> um, if you, if you are, um, like if you're if you're doubting my words, you can of course look up sources for all of this, but I don't think you'll find any that disagrees with me. Um, simply because this is like workplace efficiency is one of the most researched uh, topics in the history, right? If you are the guy who can make a uh, say a, a workplace that revolves around computers just ten percent more efficient, you're the guy that saves a company ten percent in theory. So that's a lot of money you can save right there. Um, Frederick, go ahead and ask your question. So, as a rule of thumb, would you say take a break after every game, or would you say once every hour? What would be um, m more as a general rule? I typically enforce um, one game, then discussion of aforementioned game, and then break. Um, 
So a game plus analysis and, 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 and going over it. It depends on what phase of, of working with a player or person you're in, and also whether or not you're working as a team. But but as a general rule, just make it per hour. And if if you are like uh, rather too 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 many breaks than too 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 few actually. Uh, so just enforce it like every game, because um, it's unlikely that you're gonna force two games per per hour, right? Um, so game plus analysis and then take a break. Um, All right, thank you. An additional way to do this, I'm actually gonna just bring this out there. A, a different way to do this is if you're moving away from the autocratic coaching style, that is, if you're moving away from the part where you dictate like all the things that should be improved on in the game and moving more into the portion where you begin involving the player or players in how to optimize their own gameplay, you can play the game, then say to the guys, we're gonna take five minutes break now or 10 minutes break. And in this break, I want you to think about you know, what you could have done better in this game or think about the solution to a certain issue you faced in this game and then discuss it when they come back, okay? This allows people to cool off between the game. A lot, oftentimes there's a lot of emotions and this is particularly relevant to a ranked fives, by the way, not necessarily individual coaching. <clears throat> but this allows people to take away, take out the emotions of the, the game they just played and like bring it back to like a, a calm and collected level if especially if it's the last game right that might be a really relevant way to do it i hope i answered your question you certainly did thank you absolutely okay a <clears throat> couple of tips and tricks here when I, when I say you have to cite all your work source all your work um avoid sources that aren't updated um when i say avoid sources that aren't updated you'll often like have a guy who who you know says, can you give me a guide for playing Diana? Make sure that you don't link him a guide to a mobile fire that's from season two. Pretty simple stuff, right? However, what, what you also want to be um, aware of when, I'm, when I say avoid sources that aren't updated is you want to be able to, to look at a source and say, is this guy adjusting, right? So if you have a guy who writes consistently good um, mentality guides, for example, Make sure that the guy is, is or the, the, the source you're working from is one that stays neutral throughout and isn't a hugely biased source. If I was teaching you guys how to be journalists, I'd say avoid uh, news outlets that are uh, like um, uh, politically biased to a certain extent, unless you can find the certain topic covered on two different outlets and then mix and match and find uh, commonalities, right? So it's if you want to have a, um, <clears throat> a nuanced view on Obamacare, it doesn't really make sense to just go to some sort of like some sort of a conservative news outlet like Fox News, right? It's just like you're just going to get one side. So avoid sources that aren't updated and aren't um, neutral in their, their wordings, right? Also to add on to this fact, and this is a qu controversial one, Please do avoid blindly stealing from professional play. LCS, LCK, uh, Challenger Series to a certain extent, Challenger players, this is the highest level that we can aspire to be. Most of us won't get to coach um, these players. What we can do, however, is we can watch them play. Super cool, super exciting. <clears throat> You'll find very, very few people who like playing Warwick and Challenger or in the, in the LCS, right? Uh, especially like he'll, he'll get in the meta sometimes but overall he's not a popular champion there because he has glaring flaws what you'll often find then is you'll find people who say uh you know don't play warwick because the pros don't do it so it cannot be good what you're neglecting to mention however is maybe the guy you're coaching isn't necessarily going to be dealing with the same problems a challenger player is dealing with right if warwick if playing the single target pick based champion is your best way of learning how to focus an AD carry. Please do make your guy play Warwick, right? It's not about aspiring to become as good as the pros. It's about figuring out, well, if the pros are doing something or not doing something, is this something that I really can apply to a player in Silver Elo? Like, can I can I tell a guy in Silver Elo that he should play Vayne just because they do it in the LCS? Well, not unless he likes playing Vayne, right? Like, it, it's... A lot of people will... will <clears throat> when I ask them about something they do, they'll say, double if did it. And they're like, okay, but why did double if do it? I don't know, but he did it, so it's good. And that, it's, it doesn't work like that, because if you're blindly stealing from the professionals, 
you'll end up with a bunch of players who, who says, you know, I did everything they did. I'm still not winning. What is going on, right? And that is, is a huge, huge hurdle for you to overcome as a, as, as a coach. Because not only do you open yourself up to, like, to the fact that you made a mistake and only, like, you were uh, not knowledgeable enough, but you now also have opened yourself up to the liability of having to explain to a player that... <coughs> or not necessarily having to explain to a player, but you'll, you're opening yourself up to the um, to the possibility that this player will get hugely demoralized, right? Because people, we take our idols and the people we look up to and we bring them to a sort of pedestal and we aspire to be like them, right? If you begin working with a person and you teach him everything he wants to do or should be able to do to be like their idol instead of breeding good habits that are his own, right? And instead of working on teaching him things that are completely unique to him, then that player will find, first of all, end up falling short because you will never be double lift. You can end up playing like double lift, but you will never be double lift. And until that guy becomes double lift, if he's a huge double lift fan, he will never be happy, okay? So don't try to create mini professionals. Try to create good League of Legends players. And then take the things you can from the pro scene that are relevant. I hope this is like this is a really controversial one because at the end of the day, yes, the pros are the best people. So of course, there's information to be gained from watching the pro scene. Exactly. If you see a pro player do something, you not only have to be able to understand why did the player do it, like why why did he go for the lane swap or why did he go for that all in. You also have to say, is this something that a this guy needs to know and B needs to know now, right? Yeah, sure, you might need to teach a guy that this is how you tank towers. But do you really need to teach that to a bronze guy? Can, can it wait until you get like plat, maybe? Sure, right? <coughs> and you'll end up with a, with a bunch of people. Yeah, exactly, exactly what Luke wrote here. Um, and that's really the essence of it. Um, you'll get that a lot, especially from people who are really good analysts. Typically, an analyst will pick a favorite, so to speak. Uh, if you take um, Thorin, he's like analyst typey. Um, he'll, he'll like everything you say and do. It's either gonna be Dade, uh, Pawn, or Faker, right? Or depending on what season you're in, and he'll say Faker did it, so it must be right, right? And sure, exactly, Faker is the best player in League of Legends in League of Legends history, actually. But that does not mean I should take my gold five player here in solo queue and then try to make him execute combos like Faker. Not yet, not now, maybe not ever, depending on my limitations, right? Or this player's limitations, rather. <coughs> so let's uh, talk about all these exercises I mentioned, right? We're gonna be doing a lot of, of exercises uh, like this later. What you wanna be clear on, however, is like what kind of exercises can I even do? Well, there's two kinds of exercises. There's what's called an assessment exercise and in, an improvement exercise. It's also very important that you make clear to the person you're coaching which kind of exercise you're doing so he doesn't put a lot of false confidence or false hopes into one kind of exercise. If you have a player who consistently um, cancels auto attacks but you don't know if it's because he doesn't know you know, the length of, a, of an auto attack before he can cancel it on this specific champion or if it's because he is confused by like he, the, the spell animations or whatever, you can put him through an assessment exercise. An assessment exercise is one where you take away all the clutter in a game, all the stress on the player, and then watch what is this guy's theoretic optimal, right? <coughs> if you have a guy who, um, let's say he, he consistently ends at 10 minutes and he has 60 CS, it's okay, but it's not good, right? It's not a good amount of CS at 10 minutes. Uh, you want to have closer to 100. You don't know if this guy has low CS because he gets pressured, because he cannot, like, he, because he has bad timing, because he doesn't know the auto attack length, then you can begin removing these stress elements. And you can say, okay, so he CS is better when there are no enemies in lane. So that means that some of his lack of CS stems from pressure from the enemies, right? You can also begin casting spells at him and say, is it because he's too focused on kiting or, or disengaging or whatever, right? Assessment exercises are more for you than it is for him. It's, uh, if we go back here, it's, it's the analysis part, right? An assessment exercise is, is something where you can take away all of the um, where you can take away all of the different aspects and begin <coughs> experimenting. Like, what are the actual um, facets of the issue we're working on? 
once you have your assessment exercise, you can begin looking at improvement exercises, which is like, okay, so I know now that the reason my, 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 stu my student here is lacking in CS is because he gets stressed by the fact that there are longer range AD carries in his lane. So what you do then is you set him up with an exercise where he plays against long range AD carries until he's comfortable with it, right? You teach him how to work around his long range and teach him how to optimize the amount of CS he can get. That's an improvement exercise, right? But until you've done this assessment exercise, you're unlikely to know if it's actually because of the fact he doesn't know his own champ, because of the fact that he gets stressed, because of the fact that he gets confused, um, because he just doesn't care about CS, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So make sure you know what kind of exercise you need to be doing and when. Um, you can, of course, structure this into two different uh, sites. League of Legends is kind of unique uh, and, and different to traditional sports uh, in the sense that in traditional sports, most of your coaching, most of your work in that sport will be on site, i.e. it will be at a, at a designated practice area with a designated coach. Most league players play more solo queue alone than they play with a coach. Um, unless you're like faker or like a, a pro player, you'll do most off-site, right? It's very important that you understand that on-site is always going to be most effective <clears throat> because the coach is there to live coach. You can, however, with, with good um, results, create offline or off-site um, exercises. So you can say, okay, every time before you hop into a ranked game, I want you to spend 10 minutes warming up by practicing how to CS in a custom game. Maybe you want to say, um, every time before you hop into a ranked game, I want you to go to that specific wall and flash over it. Um, once just to like learn like where exactly to stand when you flash it, right? Etc. 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 You don't need to be there for these as long as you have uh, the trust from the student and you can follow up on whether or not he does it. This is an on or an offsite exercise, which will help you and will help him build this up faster, right? Um, <clears throat> it can also be something he does in game. You can say, um, right, so the next uh, week you are only going to play these champions if at all possible in your solo queue games. I don't care about the laning phase. I don't care about whether you win or lose. I just want you to focus on getting that map control on your support, right? Your only your only goal is to look at how do I create um, opportunities to go warding in the enemy jungle, for example. That's an that you can do that offsite, right? And then you can pick like watch his replays or whatever, and pick different things you want to cover later. Um, Robert, I find this because I work in the scene and around the scene. Um, and also, when you do coach as much as I do, you begin picking up on different patterns from from different sources. Um, you can tell, by the way, from like from the way TSM plays, by the way, what kind of practice regime they have, um, what kind of structure they run in house, uh, who runs the team, etc., etc., etc. It's about <clears throat> having enough info in the game and and how to be a coach to be able to read this kind of situation. Um, and also, I, I work with a lot of the people in the pro scene, um, and they straight up tell me. Um, so yeah, um, we're gonna be moving into. Uh, I can answer more of that in the Q and A session, by the way. But uh, we, we're gonna be moving into some of the really important stuff, or not, I wouldn't even say really important, but really interesting stuff. I find this really, really cool. Um, this is a really, really well uh, known method of like, like different learning styles as a coach or right like different ways people can learn and, and pick up information um <clears throat> you'll usually find this line not there you'll usually find uh, just all seven together however i've separated because recent studies shows that people are typically one of these fives combined with one of these two down here so they're typically one one to five plus six or seven okay they're not like it's it's hard to be only seven without being also one to five, uh, and rarely people are. <coughs> what you'll find though is typically men are often, first of all, uh, kinesthetically motivated, and also intrapersonally motivated. Meaning men will typically learn better by doing and touching and playing with things and doing this alone and trying to work it out on their own, while women are typically uh, auditorily. Uh, sorry, um, verbally, linguistically motivated, as well as socially motivated or interpersonally motivated. So 
if you're working with women, they'll typically learn best from talking about it and having it explained and maybe even reading what you're working with. Um, and, and then uh, working in groups if they have to do some sort of exercise. Whereas men prefer to do and, and be alone, right? Um, this is like your solitary lion instinct. Um, these, um, these different learning styles are heavily debated in the psychology field. There is definitely some merit to, to the basis of this. And there's definitely some truth in the fact that these different learning styles exist how they get like how they come to be if they're like born in us or bred through social um stigma and 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 expectations that's a whole different ball game nobody like can give me a definitive answer on that yet at least to the best of my knowledge um however they do exist and therefore it's good for us to know that we should be working with them um <clears throat> There are good tests to gauge, like um, definitively, what kind of learning style a person is. But most of the really good ones are behind some sort of paywall on the internet. If you just Google, um, like seven different learning styles test, right, like that, you'll find a bunch of these. Some of them are kind of. Um, shady should we call it like that they're like you know uh, women's magazine or like men's magazine car magazine uh like small tests that's like you know fun little little tests and they're not scientifically based um <clears throat> so if you do want to subject a person or a group of people to these tests i recommend having them run several of them from several different sources if all of the sources or the majority of the sources say that a person is the same style it's likely to be correct right um, if you can find a, an approved one, a, def, a definitive test, one of the really good ones, it's also really good to have. Um, but those are really expensive. I think the cheapest one I found was like $40 uh, dollars, um, for like one, uh, an actual uh, an actual test accepted by a clinical psychologist, right? Or approved by clinical psychologists. Um, so what can we use these different styles for? Well. When we have a person, right, who's, who's trying to learn something and you have an exercise that can help him learn this, um, <coughs> it's very, very important that we understand that sometimes there are different ways to teach a thing, right? Um, we have a case study in a minute, an exercise that's going to work with this. But in a nutshell, what it comes down to is, well you can learn from different methods but if you have a way to appeal directly to the method that's most effective for your student or students why not take it right right why not use it this isn't a an an, an a be all end all right so you, you you can't just say you know oh there is no like my my student is uh, auditorially motivated but there's just no auditorial way to teach this so he's never going to learn it it's not it's not like that this is just to say what comes naturally to people? Um, what is, is, is the easiest way to work with people, right? Um, does anybody like not understand this? Some of them are a little, um, uh, I don't wanna say equal, like the same, but, but some of them share similarity. For example, the auditorial and the verbal can be quite um, similar in nature, but they're still different enough to have its own category. For example, if you have somebody who's orally motivated, they're less likely to be motivated by talking to people. They're more uh, likely to be basing their, their, their self on, on oral cues, right? So if they have to, to time their skill shots better, they're likely to be better, to learn better from hearing the skill shots rather than having explained to them, right? Uh, linguistics are, require a different processing uh, uh, process, right? So, so some of them are similar and all of them will work if you use them on people some of them are just more effective okay um yeah that's it 